identity, and uh, they were very fluent in dance, the, all the Spanish dances. And all their parties were Spanish. Is themed. Stella a, a Spanish name? Um, oh, sure. Uh, it means star. It means star, yes, from the Latin for star. Uh, but I was named after my grandfather, uh, who was in Greece. Uh, oh. He was killed um, by the Nazis, sadly. Oh. And so when I was born, my grandfather wanted uh, to name me after his father. His name was Silianos, and it's the female version of that. Oh, really? So it's the female her. version of that. Uh, Silianos, which is... His grandfather uh, was Greek. He yes. was named for oh. her. Yes. Greek grandfather. Yes. That's close to Russia. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, not too close. How are you in Philadelphia? We're very well, thanks. Yeah, missing, uh, I, I might have said this to you in an email, missing the northwest corner. And the, as we drove down the street, I saw Jack, you know, the furniture guy. And I just opened my window and just had to say hello because I don't get to do that in Philly. <laughs> like, we have a great life, but we don't have any friends down there. So just being. It's hard on a big Are you a couple? Yeah. Yeah. No. No, 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 we, we work together. together. Well, we I heard together. the word we. Oh, so I, I guess I meant we, because I don't think you ever met my wife, Lucinda. I did not. Um, so uh, we're all good. The kids are great. School's great. Work's great. But we just miss familiar surroundings, people, just not having to. Well, small town life is, yeah. can be special. Exactly. We miss the best parts of small town life. And yes, we don't miss. Yeah, the other bad parts. <laughs> yeah. We don't talk about those. But it's great. And the work is great. So it's just, yeah, it's nice. Um, you miss the bookstore? I do, I do. Robert, you should show him your book about poetry. Did you know that he, he published a book about um, po paintings and poetry? I did not, and we were actually talking in the car about, because I didn't know about your sort of poetry side. Yeah. Um, well, maybe you'd like to have a copy. I would love to have a copy. Because he, he deals with the whole subject of poetry and painting in this book. And I noticed a lot of your questions were about yes. going from Well, I began as poetry. a poet. Yeah. I didn't know about it. <laughs> it's a wonderful way to begin. Because well, I, I was very naive and ignorant. And so I refused to go the normal route, which is to submit poems to magazines. And I kept submitting volumes of poems to publishers. Oh, that's very <laughs> smart. <laughs> and, I mean, they had no clue. What that, what, what's this kid doing? I was 19 and, and 20. I remember a guy named, an editor named Weinstock at uh, Alfred Knopf. And, uh, and when the woman, Mrs. Bean, an elderly woman, came out to hand me my manuscript back, she saw how young I was. She asked me how, how old I was. I said, 19. <laughs> she said, just a minute. She went back with the manuscript to the editor. But he's, she came back and she said, no, he said, no. It's amazing to be so prolific at such a young age. <laughs> oh, I am. Super talented. I was driven. That's the word. I was driven. I see that Robin McGowan um, wrote the preface. Yes. So did you know him because of the poetry angle or art? or Because I knew him briefly well, before he, I guess, moved yeah, away. We were friends. I knew him. I didn't know him in, uh, as a colleague in any okay. way. Right. We, we, uh, met, we just met through friends at right. a dinner party. Right. And, and connected over poetry. Yeah, no, I mean, he. I met him because he had a bunch of his, um, this fellow was James Merrill's nephew, James Merrill, the American oh, poet. Oh, yes, right. And he had some great things. Was James Merrill in Iowa? I think so we were talking about Iowa in the car. I yes. don't remember. And I read Robin's book, which gave a great sort of portrait of the whole sort of, um, so they were, I guess it was his grandfather was the original, um, what was Merrill's first name? It's like the biggest finance, um, uh, what were they called? Um, not, uh, well, I can only think of James Merrill, which is not right. Yeah, no. Can you, can you James Merrill Lynch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the Merrill. So the James, was, so James's Merrill dad Merrill. was the Merrill of Merrill Lynch. My and first job out of college was, was on Wall Street. <laughs> and then you met Robin McGowan so many years later. It's like full circle. Isn't that interesting? How we were meant to meet people. Pardon? We're meant to meet certain people in life. Well, I guess. What was the job? What was the job on Wall Street? I, well, I was an entry level job. I was the check cashier. Okay. I wrote millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of checks every day. Right. That's fantastic. But I couldn't sign them. Poems at night and checks during the day. <laughs> I was going to Google that bit of information if you need, if you need me to. 
Um, so where, so how did you get from the, so Iowa, so sorry, the Wall Street job was after Iowa. Right. We were saying how, how important Iowa was for so many writers at the time. It was like this huge. Uh, well, it was, but um, the, the, I, I majored in literature and uh, I, I had a ridiculous amount of credits in the literature department. I'd, uh, you needed 24 for a major, and I had 48 credits, <laughs> which is ridiculous. But I took everything, and I, I just uh, really enjoyed it. But uh, when I enrolled for my junior year, my advisor said, uh, you have too many credits in English. I said, well, I, I enjoy studying it. And, you know, I took a year of a seminar in Dante and Chase. Chaucer and Shakespeare. These were all graduate courses, right. but if you interviewed, they they let you take them. He said, "Why don't you try something different?" And he handed me this enormous University of Iowa pamphlet, this big catalog, boom, <laughs> and, you know. And so, accounting, art. I said, "I can get credit for art." He said, "Oh, that would be wonderful. Take something outside." <laughs> so I'd always drawn ever since I was very. My parents were commercial artist. Right. The house was filled with, you know, drawing materials and pencils and whatever. So I said, oh, he said, sure, that would be wonderful. So I, I took a course in art and uh, you, you want to hear all that? Yeah, that's, that's why we're here. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so the professor was Stuart Eady, okay. who had been quite a known artist in New York when he was younger. Right. Shall I record one? Actually, you can. I've yes. started that one, so yeah, go for it. Excellent. So, um, he said, that's interesting, Kip. Just let me show you something. And he took my brush, mixed some paint, and as his hand, he was an older man, right. as his hand approached the canvas, I grabbed it, and I could feel his bones crunching, these <laughs> old bones, and his eyes went like that. Right. And I said, and I whispered, Tell me anything you want, but don't touch my work. I was just a kid. Right. So he walked away and talked to me for months. Right. And uh, but he whispered about me, and I heard other students tell me what he was saying, which was embarrassingly complimentary. And uh, and then I went to the art library and looked at the magazines, and I saw an advertisement of a competition for a one-man show on Fifty Seventh Street. And I won. I came in second, but they gave me a show, and I had a show. And then I, two years later, I had another show on 57th Street. You may, you may not have ever heard of the gallery, but it was well known at one time. The Harry Saltpeter Gallery. Okay. He was a very well known dealer and art critic. He was right. also an art critic. And, uh, and I had a show there. I got reviewed in the Times, Art News, blah, blah, blah. blah. Very nice, very nice reviews. Right. You ever hear the uh, critic Lawrence Campbell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. well, he described my paint, my work as as if the art of painting were being rediscovered. That's a quote. That's very nice. You can retire after a quote like that. I was just starting. Right. <laughs> Amazing. Quote. So it was <laughs> it was very nice, and I was delighted. And I sold five paintings, whatever. That wasn't so much. But then it was six years before I got another show. Right. It was. Uh, Abstract Expressionism, particularly Hans Hoffman, had a stranglehold on the art world in New York, and, and which had a considerable influence because art, New York was the art world in those days. Right. London was very secondary. Uh, San Francisco was mild. Chicago was yet to come into fruition right. as an art center, which it did. Right. But. Um, so it was very, very exciting for me. Uh, museums, etc. Right. All nice things were happening. And, but you studied under Hoffman as well, didn't you? Me? You, no. you had some connection with him? Oh, I would have killed him. No. <laughs> I think we I misread something about it. Um, yeah, I, I complained about the stranglehold okay. he and his students got it. had on oh, the his, art world. Got it, got it. I mean, that, it was, and that's the word. I. I I, I described it as a stranglehold. Right. And uh, it was unfair. It was uh, every review in art news began so and so and so and so having a show in such and such a gallery, former student of Hans Hoffman. 
Right. And you had no entry in the art world, very little entry, unless you had been a student of his. He was a, a real... Uh, so he was the gatekeeper to the art world, if you will. Yeah. And Clement Greenberg was had a similar role at the same time, didn't he? He wasn't that interested in young artists. Okay. And by the way, in those days, the definition of a young artist was someone 40. Oh, really? Oh, yes. That was that was the definition by John Kennedy. Right, okay. And he wrote that. I mean, and he was he was the art world. Right. I mean, Emily Janauer, you know that name? I, that one I don't. She was a critic for the Tribune. She had very little influence. Uh, who else was a critic in print at that time? It was pretty much... Uh, John Kennedy and right. uh, Hilton Kramer. Okay. Uh, but Kennedy was the main, the main man. Right. So it's interesting, even though um, realists like Edward Hopper were, you know, gaining ground at the time, there were people doing more realistic work. Oh no, that was much earlier. But much earlier. Oh, yes. Hopper was before me. Yes. Yes. I think I was alive during his lifetime. Yes. But he was way before me. Yes. But people were still, you know, looking for a well, continuum of abstract. Everything changed mm -hmm. with the advent of abstract expressionism. And, uh, and Leo Castelli was the dominant dealer of the time. Right. And I know I went with it to Leo Castelli with my work because he was such a prominent dealer. Right. And he's looking at my work, he says, you're in the wrong gallery. <laughs> <laughs> but he spent an hour with me, and he, we, we talked with me, and he sent me to the dealer that would change my life. Right. He sent me to the Contemporaries, which was just down the block. Right. They were both on 77th, as I recall. And uh, and that was wonderful for me. And what, do you remember what year that was, or roughly what year that was? 1958 or 9. Okay. 8 or 9. My first show at the Contemporaries was in 59. Right. And it was a huge success. And my second show was, I mean, really a big 17 paintings. That's, that's a, I mean, good reviews, art news, art in America. Yeah. I mean, was, that's a success. Yeah, absolutely. True. But, <laughs> what was the but? <laughs> he was gay and I wouldn't go to bed with him. Oh, and he said, well, if you won't do that, you have to leave the gallery. You really? might as well just take your paintings out of the gallery. After that successful show. That day. That, day. that moment. Oh, and he had a guy working there, Feeney, and he wrapped up my paintings. And within a half hour, I was on the street looking for a taxi with two big bundles of paintings. Wow. That's amazing. And my life from that moment went like that. Really? My professional life. I got home and the phone rang. Are you interested in all of this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is very great. interested in this backstory. Yeah. Okay, so what happened was, because I can talk. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have to stick to the script. Yes, no, exactly. There is no script. Yes. So the phone rang. The phone rang, and it was a private dealer, Muriel Werner. And she said she had seen my work at her friend's house, and she thinks she could sell it. I said, well, fine. Come to my studio. I had a little $40 a month studio on 29th, 26th Street. Uh, and uh, it, it was nothing, but it was a room. Right. Uh, small, uh, no big, smaller than this room. So uh, she said, no, I have a meeting tonight. Now I have to make a presentation. I'd like to bring one of your paintings. Well, who's this crazy lady, you know? So she came over. I said, well, come on over. And in the hallway, we had clotheslines strung with wet diapers that my wife had bought. You know, right. we had two little kids, right. very little. So uh, she came over and she picked out a painting. And she said, I think I can sell this painting. And I was, who is it? You know. Right. So uh, she said, how much do you want for it? Net to you. Right. And I said, well, 350 And I said 350 I mean, I didn't have a real established price, but um, I said three fifty because three fifty paid all our bills for a month. Right. Rent, food, right, rent on the little studio, right, everything. So she took the painting and she sold it. She sold forty paintings that year. Wow. Forty. Forty. 
42. That's right. And, um, and the interesting part is that she and her husband, Ernest, um, they were really very honorable people, right. more than you would expect. Because they came to me one day and said, uh, we don't feel right selling all your paintings because we're selling them and people are buying them. We know a lot of collectors, they knew a who's who of New York. But she said, he said, she said, um, you should be known, you should be seen. I said, I'm not going to go to the gallery. I said, I, I've done that. I don't like that. We've made a connection for you. We went to Far Gallery, exactly. which at that time was a very established, really important gallery. Right. And uh, they'd like to see your work. They'd like to talk to you. So I went down and I spoke to the, the director. Excuse me. The director of the gallery was Murray Roth. Okay. The owner was Herman Wexler. And uh, he, boy, he fell in love with my work. He wanted me. He had my work in the window. Now they had, a, their gallery was between the 65th and 66th, or maybe 64th and 65th. Right on Madison, right on the west side of Madison, right on Madison, right. And they had two windows, right on Madison, and he had a painting of mine in the window every day for seven years. Wow, that's amazing. every day, right on Madison Avenue. They sold a ton of my work. Right, I had shows. This is before prints. It's all paintings at this point, or had you started printmaking? No, I hadn't started printmaking. It, it, they were doing very, very well with my work, and it was he, Murray Roth, who said. You should make prints. Right. So I went to, I uh, forget the name of the place, and I bought a little press. Right. And I drilled the holes in the, uh, an old bureau. And right. Bolted it down. Right. And I started printing dry points. Do you think that he wanted you to make prints because this would um, enlarge your audience, you know, keep up with the demand for your work? He was basically a print dealer. Right. And he had a print, a huge knowledge of the prints and print world. Yes. And he really liked prints. I do too, it's my passion. <laughs> so I made prints. Wonderful. And he said, no, no, no. I meant lithographs. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right. So I said, well, how am I going to do that? I don't know anything about it. I made him. Um, what do you call it? an appointment for you or whatever it is right. to go down to the Bank Street Atelier? Did you ever hear of them? I've not. They were okay yeah. famous at the time. Yes. Yeah. I went down to the Bank Street Atelier and I started working on limestone. Well, I loved. It. I fell in love with it. Right. I mean, it was just it was just amazing. And uh, I did the prints. And the rest is history. I mean. I started to make real money. I mean, we were limping along, my wife and I, and right. two kids, and now we had four children. And but uh, I was really making a lot of money. And was it simply because you, there was literally multiples that instead of selling one painting, you were selling ten of the same image? It was more than that. But because I had multiples, I had the ability to have many dealers. Right. And I could, and I started to have dealers in different cities. And you know, 15 prints and five or six paintings makes a nice small show in a small gallery in a small town right. like Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, mean, I, I don't take a person. I feel like um, prints allow an international, international audience also. It's very easy to, to export prints all over the world. Well, but there's a big print world. There is. The print world is separate from the painting world. It's a very distinct world and dealers and collectors and they're very interesting. Uh, painting collectors tend to buy paintings with a, what do you call it? Some kind of authentication by right. the print world, by the art world. By the, right. But print collectors if they like a print, they'll buy it, unless it's, you know, outrageously priced. My prints were very inexpensive, $50, $60, $100, right. $75. It's 
It opens a whole new audience for events. It was so different. And suddenly, I had dealers all over the country. And I, I, in order to take advantage of this, I took a bus trip to San Francisco with two big cartons of paintings. Right. Excuse me, I have to what sneak, is it there? sneak out the door to talk to the guy. Oh. Cutting the grass. Understand. Where was I? Um, you took your two big boxes of oh, paintings to San Francisco. And I resolved not to consign the paintings. Once you got there. Pardon me? Once you got there. Once I got out there, I took a nonstop bus ride. Right. Greyhound? Greyhound. <laughs> I was rank. <laughs> night and day. It was night and day. You know, I didn't stop or wash or anything. Right. So I checked into hotels. Took off my shoes and my belt and got in the shower. <laughs> all my clothes. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, with all my clothes. And I remember, I remember very much, you know, soaping down all the clothes, right. rinsing them, and then myself, and then lying on bed and just collapsing. And then the next day, I got my two cartons and I went out. And I think I sold, I forget how many paintings I had, but I sold some paintings. Who was the dealer out in San? That was San Francisco. I can't remember, but I know I stopped in Los Angeles. Joan Wheeler Ankrum, does that ring a bell? Uh, she see. was a prominent dealer. I stopped there. She bought some paintings. Okay. And I wish I had those paintings now. They were, I, I, I have such a fond recollection of some of those paintings. I had some good paintings. And, by, and I stopped along the way. I saw a guy named Calhoun in Houston. He bought some paintings. I came back with no paintings and a pocket full of checks. <laughs> it was, I, mean, I was poor. Right. I was working nights in the post office. After that, I had a night job in the bookstore. Uh, Are we still point? writing? Are we still writing poetry at this point? We did want to ask you, did, did you stop writing poetry when you started painting? Or, or did that oh, always no, continue? No. I stopped writing poetry when I had to start getting a job and working at night. And I, I, I had to decide. And since I was exhibiting and having some sales and recognition and not publishing at all, did I tell you why I couldn't publish my poems? No. No. I was ignorant, unaware totally of that the route to becoming established as a poet was to send poems to magazines. It never occurred to me. In fact, I looked down on it, I disdained it. And I kept putting together volumes of poems and sending them to publishers. Well, they're not gonna publish a volume of poems by someone they never heard of. Right. But I understand your thinking. You wanted them to look at your body of work I, rather than just one poem. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, it was very sense. important to me. Absolutely. I remember a, a knock getting a very terse. I got into it, but they, the uh, editor wasn't going to have any of it. But the woman there, one of the editors, wanted to. But uh, she was impressed with how young I was. I was young. It is, it is very impressive that you actually could produce a volume of work at such a young age. And you had something to say. I was driven. Absolutely driven. And then when I started painting, I was writing and painting. And then uh, when I started showing, uh, it was, you know, I, I liked that a lot. Right. It, it wasn't what I expected. And then the war came. What was the first war? Vietnam or Korea? Korea. 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 Yes. And uh, I got drafted. And, but it said, the notice said if I was in school, I'd get deferred. So I decided, and only for that reason, to go to graduate school. Right. To do your MFA? Hmm? To do an MFA? Well, I didn't want to get an MA in, in, uh, in literature. I had 48 hours as an undergraduate. Right. But uh, a degree in an MA in literature meant nothing. But an MFA was a term, at that time, a terminal degree. Now they have PhDs. But at that time, it was a terminal degree and it qualified me to teach in college which is I wanted to do. And the right. idea of teaching in high school, I mean, I just, 
and taking education courses. That was, that wasn't. So I got the MFA and, and uh, couldn't get a job. Couldn't, I got one interview, but I, I couldn't get a job. It's amazing when you, when you listen to that now, because, you know, here you were a prolific painter and well known at the time, and, and now with a graduate degree and so much knowledge to be able to give to your students that someone wouldn't give you the opportunity to. I would have been a very, I think a very good teacher. I think knows. So. But they didn't want to hire artists. They wanted to hire people who had an education background. I mean, most of my, uh, most of the, there were 24 of my, when I eventually got an MFA, there were 24 in my graduating class and they all had um, education courses. And they all got jobs. I was the only one who didn't get a job. Right. But you didn't go to Korea either, right? I didn't go to Korea. I was the only one that had a Thanks career. Right. <laughs> they all got jobs teaching, and that's where they languished. Right. Yeah. And they were talented. There were there were a few that were really, I thought, quite talented, but never went anywhere. Right. They were older. They had been veterans. A lot of my uh, fellow students were older because like they GI Bill sort of GI Bill exactly right. exactly and they were much more sophisticated and worldly and right they were on their own trajectory presumably oh really right I mean they were on the GI Bill I was on the mama papa bill <laughs> <laughs> well, you had a family to support and hmm? you you were in different circumstances oh life. very a family and a wife and yeah and I, well, I, I was very innocent, and they were not. <laughs> I think it was a different time. People were very absolutely innocent, and. Um, but I got all that money when we played poker. <laughs> you had strategy. I. Well, there's another side to me. As a as a high school kid, I was the best pool player in Queens. Okay. I was a shark. Right. I was really good. And I knew my way around the gambling world. Right. And uh, and I later took up three cushion billiards, which is a little different than pool. Right. And uh, in a in a pro tournament at McGurr's, which is a big prominent New York pool room, right. I came in fifth of the field of eighteen pros. So yes. I was. You were a teenager at the time. No, I was forty. Oh, okay. I went back. You went back. Okay. It up. You're a true Renaissance man. What what other things interested you at the time besides obviously being a great girls. artist and poet and girls. girls. Oh. Yes. Absolutely. Love is always very but important. I, in life. I never I never sold them. I didn't traffic. Right. Of course. And when you were um, jumping back to the I guess the early sixties. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm just I'm trying to remember a thread that I had. So you were living in Manhattan at the time, or were you in Queens or when, the island yeah. in the early 60s when, when printing, when printmaking? Okay. No, I um, moved to Manhattan in 1969. Right out of school. Okay. I never went back to Queens. Right. And I lived in a cold water flat. I don't know if you know what that is. Mm -hmm. There was no heat, no hot water. Right. And it was legal. Right. Where were, do you remember where it was? First Avenue and Ninth Street. Okay, I know that well. Right yeah. on the corner. Okay. on the southeast corner. Right. And uh, it was an interesting neighborhood because one block over was a Polish neighborhood, right. Second Avenue, uh, with wonderful restaurants right. that I couldn't afford. Right. But I could, once in a while, scrape together enough to go over there for a sandwich with my, with my first wife. Right. She worked at a place called Fairchild Publications, okay. an entry-level job that paid nothing, almost, you know, minimum. Uh, but uh, we were, we got along. It was pleasant. Right. It was pleasant. Did you approach printmaking very different to your painting, or was it the same approach? Well, it was very different when I made dry points, mm -hmm. which were my first prints. But then I made lithographs, and in, in lithography, it's similar to painting in that you're really drawing with form. At my approach to lithography is not linear. It's, it's volume, form, light and shade. And it was very much like my painting. 
And I really took to it very well. And I was commissioned to do five editions by the, did you ever hear of the Associated American Artists? Yes. Uh, yes. That was very prestigious at the yeah, time, absolutely. Sylvan Cole. Yes. And so he commissioned me to do five prints, which I did. Oh, and I also got a commission from, I mean, really, the money started rolling in uh, from the Book of the Month Club. Oh, right. oh, and that was, they had a division called Fine Arts 260 because they did editions of 260. Yeah. And I think it was headed up by a man named Carl Kinellan. And it was very interesting. And uh, they bought a lot of prints. I did very nice work for them. They couldn't afford full color and I was, and color cost money because you have to pay for each color. Right. It's a separate run of the prints. So uh, they, uh, uh, they did, um, but not black and white. I, I met with them and uh, I did prints with them in a sort of a blackish green, a dark green, a dark blue, or dark brown. Okay. And so they had the sense of color, uh, but they had that fine grain of lithographic stone. Right. It was so nice. I wasn't using plate yet. Right. It does add a wonderful texture to the work. Very nice. Thank you. Very, very luscious. Yes. Sensuous. Yes, absolutely. Ooh. But what happened was, did you, did you ever hear the printing company called George C. Miller and Son? My printer was Burr Miller. Okay. George C. Miller founded George C. Miller Inc. as a photographer. The first fine, the first fine art, professional fine art lithographic workshop in America, 1915. Right. And I printed with his son George Burr. I printed with his son Burr, B U R R. <laughs> Naturally. Right. And uh, a after many prints, or maybe 400 prints, I, I mean, many editions, many editions, hundreds, he was having trouble printing my work. He said, the stone won't print that fine. It'll fill in. Right. He says, I'm having trouble with it. I said, what should I do? I want to make prints. He said, well, I suggest you try a new technique, at least new to him at that time, right. working on mylar. Which, uh, where the artist draws on mylar, it's burned into a plate, and it's printed on a lithographic place. And they had these big cylinder presses, and it was mechanically printed. Right. And I did that for a couple of years, but I didn't feel like I was making prints anymore. Right. I felt I was making drawings that were reproduced. Right. Now, they were original lithographs, technically, right. and were sold legally as original lithographs. And I had lots of shows, and by then I was showing really all over the country, in England, Japan, South America. I had a lot of shows there. But uh, I didn't like it. I quit. Right. I just quit. When was that? Do you remember what sort of year that might have been? Around 1990. Okay. I think I made my first mezzotints in 92. I think that's where, where I was going with the question. That Pardon? I knew that you started your mezzotints in the early 90s. Yes. yes. What happened was I walked into an art supply store called Sam Flax. Mm -hmm. Just to buy my usual. Great store. store. Very, it was. Was this on like Park and 50 or something like that? Is that where it was at the time? It was over near Park, but I think it was in the 30s. Right, okay. I think it was in the 30s. I'm not, not sure. So, um, and I got to know the people there. There were two Flax brothers. Sam was still in the business, and they had two sons, Sidney and Leo. Right. And um, it was very interesting, you know, looking around. But I saw these copper plates that had a matte finish. I said, what are those? Said, those are mezzotin plates. They're pre rock Right. They are made in Japan by Sakura, and they were very, very wonderful. I, I bought it. I used them, and it was very successful. What happened was I, somewhere in the 80s, I bought a huge amount of them. They came in this huge wooden crate from Japan. Right. It was just wonderful. But the packing was incredible. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I still have them. 
I mean, I've been, I use them every year, right? 12 or 15 a year, and I still have them. Well, there were big plates, 20 by 20. I, I have them cut down. Right. And so I, I'm still using them. They're wonderful plates. And uh, Japanese have such a great history of printmaking. Uh, there are companies, other companies that make pre rock Mexican plates. But if it's not really finely done, then you don't get the full gradations. Right. You know, it just doesn't print the same. It's um, it's crude. It's you know, you can you can you can, you tell. can send you can, it just isn't right. Right. And when I run out of these plates, I'm certainly not going to get any. I probably won't run out. <laughs> you still have some. Being ninety-one. Actually, it brings me to one of the questions that we wanted to talk to you about. What is that? Um, you spoke about your printmaking experience. You stated that when you first started, you loved the prints and making the plates, but you hated the physical process of printing them. Couldn't stand it. Well, was it because they were so time laborious? Or? I love to make things, but the idea of making them repetitively, yeah. over and over, and trying to get it the same without trying to introduce something a little different, you know. Yes. It, but then I found that there were people who printed. And so I got, first I got a, a young woman printer, Susan something or other, Clemens, who was a nightmare. <laughs> and then I went with, you probably heard of Kathy Caraccio. Yes. Very, very well-known well printer. Known and she was very good, but um, unreliable. I mean, her work was good, her work was reliable. But I would drive in from Westchester to her studio in the 30s downtown, and she wouldn't be there. Okay. And I'd sit in the stairwell and wait, and she'd come an hour late. Now, I'd wait because I drove all the way down, yeah. you know, and so later, yes. she'd finally show up and she'd say, oh, yes, I forgot. I mean, but not paying very short shrift. Right. So I heard about Tony Kirk, and so after printing with her for a few years, I called Tony and he said, well, uh, let me see your plates and we can talk about it. Right. So I went to see him. I forget where he was. I don't think he's where he is. I don't know where he was. But I know that within a half an hour, he had five proofs to create three different plates. You know, on different papers. Right. It was just, I mean, he was just great. And we've been printing ever since. It's beautiful. You found the master printer that you needed. That was no, he's, he's, a, he's a wonderful printer. He's a nice person. And he's a friend. Speak, we're, we're sort of friends. I, I mean, we don't socialize, but when he comes to pick up plates or deliver prints, we have coffee or tea and, you know, we sit and chat. Right. And discuss the work, of course. Nice shoe. Thank you. I just had them polished. <laughs> with working with a master printer like that over the years, do you, does he know what you're trying to achieve? Do you have those conversations? He has a good idea mm -hmm. of what I need. Yes. And, uh, and what he needs to emphasize. Or he'll show me proofs and I'll tell him, <clears throat> this area needs to be wiped a little better and maybe you could leave a little more ink in this area things like that but uh, he's very very good very sensitive and very um, he listens you know i mean i've had printers who explain to me I said, wait, no, wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> you're printing my work <laughs> you're working for me uh, the bank street outside was was really strange i remember showing my one plate to someone at the Bank Street Atelier, Frank Akers. And I said, hey, well, you, you think you can print this? And he looked at it and he said, sure. You want all those little lines? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Hello? So, uh, never heard of him again. I thought he was going to be a luminary in the art world, in the printing world, but disappeared. Was there always a palette that you were looking? Um, I can't hear. Was there always a, a certain palette of color that you were looking to a express? Palette of color. Palette. You... In printmaking. In printmaking, yes. 
Well, no. Uh, my prints were basically black and white. Even, and when I printed the the the, the main stone in in a, in a darkish green or a darkish brown or a darkish blue, blackish, um, and we added color. The color was more tinting. It was more. I did a lot of color lithographs, a lot of them, but. One is not struck by them as being vividly colored. Absolutely. Mm. That, that, that was my take. And I was wondering whether this changed gradually, whether you started with more color and, no. and then became more mm. monochromatic. No. no, I never used bright colors. Now, my first paintings were more colorful. Oh, by the way, I began as an abstract painter. Yeah. My first paintings, the first several months were abstractions and uh do you know what led you to that was that did you want to do that or did you just end up doing that did you aspire to it i can't say i aspired to it i mean the art world was abstract and so i was an artist and i would do abstract paintings but it didn't satisfy me. right you know, and I gradually introduced um, imagery. The cover of that book is sort of an abstract landscape, right? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty abstract. You might not even know it was a landscape. Right. No, now that you say it, it obviously is, but looking at no. it before. Yes, right. Yeah. So my first paintings were abstractions. But I just wasn't fulfilled by them. Right. And uh, would you say that you weren't expressing your authentic self? Maybe, but I, what I really was was restless and unfulfilled. And so I started introducing images, and I liked it. And he saw that it was good. Absolutely. <laughs> and people loved them as well. So well, they did. It was very nice. That was that was a surprise. Well, I had my first two shows, and it took me six years to get another show. And that was six years of every six months, twice a year, going to taking two weeks off and putting work under my arm and going to a couple hundred galleries twice a year, and I would. You know, I would get some very terrible responses. Some people, you ever hear a dealer named Peter Heller? He was insulting. He said, what do you think you should look like standing there with your paintings under your arm? There's no reason to be insulting. It's very bad for you. I mean, I was just some guy walking in off the street with some paintings. Right. Hopeful. So that went on for a while. And then I came to the contemporaries. And the guy running the contemporaries would. Did I talk to you a little bit about this? Carl Lundy? Carl no. L U N D E. He wrote, a, a later wrote a book about my work, the graphic work by Carl Lundy. And um, he, 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 he said, Well, leave your work, I'll think about it. So I, it was on the corner of 77th and Madison. And in those days, Sotheby's was called Park Burnett. Right. And it was right next door. Right. It was, it was on Madison between 77th and 76th. And he was on the corner of 77th. Right. Uh, a building called the Hyde Park Hotel. Maybe right. You know that. Office at the Carlisle, right? Wasn't the Carlisle? Correct. Right, okay. So. So you left your pictures with I left you. my paintings there. And he called me up and he says, you can pick them up now. I left them on a early in a week, this was on Thursday, I went into the right painting. So as I picked up the paintings, he said, no, not, not those, I'm buying those. I go, whoa, what? <laughs> I said, oh. So he wrote a check, he said, how much do you want for them? And they were smallish paintings. I had no money and I wasn't selling anything. I said, 
well, give me $100 a piece and he wrote me a check for $300, which was enough to pay my family for a month, right. to support my family for a month. It's, so It's interesting because there were no agents, you know, at that no, time. No. So you had to do everything. Oh, money, I, you know? Well, there were agents, but they weren't interested in me. I guess they were here. I don't know. They were here. So what happened after so he bought the, the three pictures? So he bought those three paintings and he came to my studio and picked out a number more. And then I had a show and we sold 17 paintings. It was my first, you know, it was my third show, but right. it was my first major show. After that six year sort of yeah, desert. Great. Right. Right. So we sold 17 paintings. And I, that was thrilling. It was thrilling. Reviews were good. The rest is history, as they say. Hmm? It, it, it all went it, a huge trajectory. Oh, it was very, very nice. Yes, you know? Absolutely. The private dealer was selling my work. No, not yet. Not yet. That was later. That was later. And did you, when you got into printmaking full time, and it was, did you continue to paint, or were you? Oh yes. Okay. Oh, so you're always doing both. I painted until just a few years ago. Okay. Maybe four or five years. I stopped painting because I, can't, I can't stand the fees on anymore. Right. I just can't do it. I mean, I use a cane to walk. Right. Yeah. But, and did you always sell paintings throughout the printing? Like, oh, oh yeah, very right. well. Right. I had a lot of shows. What happened was a big turning point came in 67. Um, a dealer, or 68, a dealer came to me who had been looking for me. He had seen my work in the window of Far Yard. Uh, and he and his son, they came from Chicago, uh, had seen my work in the window as they passed in a cab. And they went back and Far Gallery wouldn't tell them who I was or where I was. But they could see the name was Kipnis. Right. And so they, they searched the phone book and every time they came to New York, which was twice a year, they, or maybe four times a year, this was Merrill Chase in Chicago. Okay. And they had 11 galleries. Huge name. And they were big, beautiful galleries. They were really nice galleries. They had a lot of good art. And uh, and they took nothing on consignment. They bought everything. That's key. They bought, a, they bought five or six editions a year outright. Right. And they bought 30 from each of my editions. And almost all my paintings. I remember the first time uh, Merrill came to my uh, uh, studio and he selected some paintings and he said, send them to me. And he gave me his address for the gallery and everything. Send them to me and I'll send you a check. So I made a big crate and bought lumber and cut to size. You know, they milled it for me. And right. I nailed it, screwed it all together, nailed it together. Um, I sent them the paintings and I said, well, I'll never hear from that crook again. <laughs> and I got a check. It was a lot of money. Right. It was a lot of money. And was this, that was when he first found you? Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. That's how he found me. Right, right. Knocked on my door. Right. Amazing wonder of yellow pages, right? Yeah. What it looks like. It was really, he said, I've been looking for you for months and months and months. And so he, uh, Was there this idea of, of an exclusive arrangement between you and the gallery, or were you a free agent? Were you were you able to, uh, to sell uh, through many many outlets? Well, when I had a deal in New York, they didn't want me to show with anyone else in New York. When I showed with Merrill Chase in Chicago, I couldn't show with anyone else in Chicago. We didn't care what I did in San Francisco. Right. And what came from Merrill Chase was wonderful, because he had a lot of galleries. He had directors, and they used to fight over who was, when my paintings would come to the warehouse, who was going to, which gallery was going to get the, I was very flattered. And so uh, a lot of those dealers, a lot of those directors of his galleries went on to open galleries in other cities. Garrett Wurzer, who you may have heard of in tech in Houston, mm -hmm. uh, Ken Beam in Seattle, Cindy Foster, I forget where she is, I got it upstairs. And anyway, a lot of dealers. It must have been wonderful to see your work through generations, you know, of galleries. It was interesting. Yes. It was always, but I was driven. 
I mean, I was driven to work, so I never spent much time reflecting on what was happening. I reflected on my work, and I thought about it a lot. Uh, but I, I never reflected much on my career until I got much older, so lately, really. You were too busy living your life, but they had such a prolific career with so much wonderful paintings. Well, thank and, you. And limited edition prints, and everyone could own a little part of, of the Kipnis, well, which is you. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind. Wow. But it was always about the work. Uh, I remember saying to some, in something I wrote, uh, I never cheated myself at the easel. Right. I, I really did what I had to do, or what I needed to do, or whatever I could do. Right. And I did it. And it came out okay. Uh, I have done a lot of work. I have no idea how much I've done. I don't know. And it's a whole new life now in the secondary market. Which I well, think is I mean, there was a, a long period of time where I did 100 paintings a year. And so there must be literally tens of thousands of paintings out there, hundreds of thousands of prints. Right. And do you, do you still make art? I know you said you, you're not painting every day. Diesel. Still. I'm working right. on plates. Great, great. I, I don't think I'll be able to use them all up. Right. I've got a lot of plates. <laughs> These pre rock mezzotint plates. Right. They're beautiful. They're wonderful. We hope you do. Hmm? We hope you do. We're awaiting your work, which is always wonderful. No, I, 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 it's it's wonderful. It's wonderful to work. It's. Uh, I think I, I I remember the last line of the book I wrote, not that book. The I wrote a, a, a autobiography. Oh, did you? You don't have that? Mm -mm. Would you like that? I would love that. You yeah, might me to give it to you before you leave. I will, and I'm totally intrigued by that one as well. So. But the last line of that book was, the great reward for making art is making art. Great, a good line. I think. That's a great line. Yeah, it's a good line. In other words, the process itself is what, re what is rewarding to you. Oh, just the act, the, the involvement, the engagement. I never met... You ask about the people who buy my work or collect it. I hardly knew anyone who bought my work. And I sold through dealers. And, and uh, for me to sell personally is competing with the dealers. Okay. And, and they discouraged that. They didn't like it. Most artists do it. Uh, I sold to some very, very close friends because it would seem wrong to send right. a, a really intimate friend to a gallery. Sure. But, uh, but other than that, no. And, uh, and the dealers respected that and appreciated that and expected that. Right. They should. They should. Otherwise, it's competition. Right, exactly. You need them and they need to be able to do their jobs. Yeah. And if they have competition, like if I had two dealers in the same city, you end up with no deal. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. But it's wonderful to have mm, that honor um, all your life, you know, that, that you only uh, work through dealers. Yeah. I did have, from my dealers for them, almost entirely, a great deal of enthusiasm. And that I appreciated. And uh, one of the turning points in my career was when I began to understand how expensive it was to be a dealer. I mean, they had rent, they had salaries to pay if they had a staff, even if it was one, they had electricity, right. they, had, they had mailing, they had printing, because they had to put out brochures. It was, uh, it was a lot of work. And one of my dealers used to have uh, <clears throat> addressing parties instead of hiring a service to address all the invitations for every three weeks for all the shows right. uh, five or six people would come in and sit around and address all the envelopes right that's great it was very nice it was, and they provided lunch which was a couple sandwiches right. and a coke 
it was uh, it was interesting. Unfortunately, you know, uh, twice in my career, I may have mentioned it. Um, personalities got in the way. Uh, dealers uh, were sexually predatory, right. and uh, gay dealers especially, and and that was a problem for me, twice. Right. And um, and yet later, one of those dealers who sent me packing wrote the book on my uh, prints, the graphic work. Right. Uh, which surprised me. Did he write it with you or on his own? Like, were you involved uh, with he that? He got the commission from the publisher. I think it was Adverse Books. And, um, but he had to interview me because it, 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 it was a catalog raisonné of the lithographs, I think. Right. Um, I'll remind me to get that too. Okay. I have them upstairs. And uh, it was a very nice book. And you, um, were you able to work together, however briefly, that second time? Was there any? It was, uh, was no problem. Right. Did he remember or did he pretend to not remember? Well, he pretend. I don't know if he pretended not to remember, if he pretended to not remember or if he really didn't remember, because he was severely alcoholic. Right. Oh, right. So he may have forgotten the whole experience. It's very possible. Right. And clearly did a good job on the book, so it was professional enough nice to book. do it what he needed to do. very nice book. And frankly, if he hadn't been such a bastard, he was a nice guy. Right. It's just that he wasn't. A nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> Fundamentally. <laughs> Unfulfilled potential. He was a nice guy until he wasn't. Right. Well, I wonder, Stella, do you think we've covered all the bases? I don't want to wear you out with. You're not wearing me out. It's really great. Unfortunately, I like the talk. <laughs> Let's see. Let me think. I would like to ask you about sort of your poetry and who influenced, if there was an influence on your poetry? Well, my early influences were, were, were Shelley and Keats. Wonderful, my favorites. Why not? Wonderful, right. Absolutely. Yeah. I read a lot of Shelley and Keats. Very strange. And, uh, but you know, I, I, I took, uh, later I was, I can't say I was influenced as much as I was impressed and, and deeply, uh, it was a deep experience when you read Dante. I, I took a, one of your seminar in Dante. Right. And uh, that was with a, a renowned scholar. Iowa had some renowned scholars. Right. And uh, this was John McGallion. He was, he was excellent. Uh, I studied Shakespeare with a renowned scholar whom I didn't like and who really turned me off. But I liked Shakespeare, of course, but right. I didn't like him. And um, I took a year of Chaucer, which was very interesting. We had to learn the language. Right. You know, because in translation, it's not quite the same. No. It's Middle English. You right. Know, right. You know. Let's see, let's see. Poets and artists. I think my first great influence as an artist, which didn't influence me stylistically, but did uh, as a person, was Max Beckman. I was very enthralled with his work. I remember having lunch with his widow. I think her name was Quappy. Okay. And uh, Beckman, that was really my, really, I don't think I had, a stylistic influence because I really just sort of created my own work. Right. You know, I didn't study with someone who taught me how to work. Right. So I. Uh, you had your own voice from the very beginning. So mm -hmm. How I see it is that you had your own voice to express from the very beginning. As a painter? Yes. No. No. no my first work was abstract expression. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, but it evolved from there. 
Yeah, very soon, very soon. And when I started using imagery, uh, I think I think you could see it. You could see me coming out. Now that you have time, a lot of time to reflect on on the past, was it a, a wonderful, a wonderful experience? No. Uh, there was no other way I could do it. I had to find my way, but it was very, very difficult. Uh, there, were, there were many years of, of, of searching. Working nights in the post office. Also, this I find, because you know, we all go through the same journey, but maybe in different areas of our life, um, until you, you get that that's good validation or. Where are you going? Just popping outside for a second. I'll be right back. Where? It takes funny. When you're in the situation where you actually feel that you've arrived, you've become a certain age. You know, it doesn't come. It doesn't come quickly. You know. I don't remember having that feeling. Ever? Not really. Yeah. I mean, obviously, in reflection, I've had a career and it's been successful. Yes, absolutely. But I can't pinpoint when I felt confident that that you know, my work I is, don't know. is 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 is. I never equated a successful career as an artist with making money. I made really a lot of money. Many, many millions of dollars. Wonderful. I mean, really good. I mean, yes. It's a huge. Merrill Chase in Chicago and Carol Hunt in Texas. These people were extremely, extremely successful. They pushed my prices. They sold. It was just... Uh, I was surprised. My parents were surprised. It was well deserved. Well, thank you. That's kind of you to say. As you know, no one knows what is in store. The work for most artists, when they die, is forgotten. The career ends and it's over. Cold, over, dead, finished. Uh, some artists survive, their work survives their lives. Uh, that's rare. It, just, it doesn't happen much. Right. I think the majority are forgotten. Lost, right. right. I, mean, I remember some very big, big names when I was young. You ever hear the artist Lee Mulliken? No. Cover of Art News. <laughs> big, big deal. Right. Nobody knows who he is or who he was. Right. If he is, <laughs> but it was, um, you just don't know. You just don't know. And there's no way of knowing. You just do the best you can. I want to look at some of these questions again. Thank you so much. Happy. As far as putting people in, in, uh, landscapes, uh, I was always surprised at how easily some artists did that because they didn't look like they stood out. They right. just looked like part of the landscape, like right. object in the landscape. And I, it, it never was a part of how I could work or felt impelled to work. Right. But it, uh, I admire it. But I like, well, let me put it this way. When I was young, I lived. In, I grew up in a little town called Laurelton, Long Island. Okay. It's uh, just on the border between Queens and Nassau, whatever it comes there. Right. And uh, it was a little rural town at that time. This is the 1930s. Right. It was very rural. And there was a long track of woods between Laurelton and Rosedale, the next community. Right. And that's where I spent my youth, alone, in the woods, playing. Right. I would take a potato from my mother's kitchen that she didn't know I took, <laughs> dig a little hole, put the potato in the hole, build a fire over the hole, and sit there just enjoying being alone in the woods. I mean, really, woods, dark. Right, right. And uh, then I'd eat the potato. 
go home with no appetite, of course. <laughs> it sounds magical. <laughs> and, uh, and I had my bicycle, which was very important to me. I don't know if it matters to an interview like this, but uh, my parents were very sadistic people. Oh, and they were really cruel. Mm -hmm. wow. And um, I'm so sorry uh, to hear that. I remember as a child feeling quite lonely and only being at home when I was alone in the woods. Right. Which is what I get from my work and what I think I communicate. Right. A real sense of belonging in the, in, in the, in the, in the landscape. And why the landscape has no people, right. the unpopulated landscapes. So the woods was, was a refuge, if you will. Very much so, yeah. Well, uh, the refuge was not only the woods, but my mind. Yes. You know, Absolutely. without the interference, the static. Right. The static. They were really cruel. I, I don't want to go into that. Really no, that's, I'm sorry to hear it. Just yeah. like, you know. It was physically cruel and, and mentally. And in every which way. I, to prepare for this interview, I read quite a bit of interviews. And, and I can't person. hear you. To prepare for this interview, I read quite a few interviews that you had in the past, and I don't recall ever hearing that. Well, I never had an interview quite this in depth. I'm so <laughs> glad. That makes me feel really good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. important to know, you know why one visits and revisits a place yeah. in life. My father grew up very, very poor in Paris. His father had been a tailor in Russia, and they immigrated to Paris, and they were very, very poor, I mean, dirt poor. And uh, my father, at the age of four, was driving a milk truck, delivering milk with horses. And it was just, you know, his life was very hard. Right. He became a very big success as an art director for Sears Roebuck. He, that was his catalog. He right. did a third of the catalog. It's right. amazing. He designed it. Right. And uh, the other third was, two thirds were done in Chicago. Right. But the, he did the third in New York. They wanted him to move to Chicago to take charge of the whole thing, and he didn't want to. And because his family was here. Right. He had brothers and sisters, and and my mother's family was much larger, and they were all here. Right. Is this when you were a child or is this before? Yes, right. yeah, I was very much a child. Did he live to see your success? I can't hear you. Did he live to see your success? Yeah. <laughs> Did that change anything in the dynamic of the relationship? It was very difficult for him. He came to my first show at the Contemporaries and he saw the show, it was a big show. Very successful show. Right. He didn't come to the opening because he didn't want to see my mother. They were divorced, so he didn't okay. want to see my mother. And so he was looking around at the show. And then he looks and he looks. And he looks at me and he says, You can't use the name Kidness. And I said, Why not? He said, That's my name. I don't so know what strange. that meant. I don't I, I really don't know what it meant. He was not terribly articulate, except when he was being cruel. Right. But he was not very articulate. Right. Did he change at all towards mm -hmm. the end? Did he change at all towards the end of his life to look back and reflect on what had transpired? I don't think so. I, I really don't. I used to visit him. He had remarried and had two small children. And I visit him a few times, not often. He lived in Greenwich. He was retired. Big house in Greenwich. Sears gave Christmas bonuses in stock okay. in those days. Not they, it's been a long time since they were doing that. Right. And you couldn't sell your stock until you retired. So when he retired, he, he was a very wealthy man. Not until he retired, but when he retired, he had his pension from Sears Roebuck, but he, he had a, a, a lot of money. Right. And they lived very well. And did your mother keep up with your career? Or care? She did. Yeah, I would say she came to my shows and uh, 
She must have been very proud. She was proud. As I said, I, I, I don't know if you've ever known severely mentally handicapped people. Yes, but I she, she, they were really. Yes, they were really. They were troubled. My mother was troubled. Right. She was a nice person for the most part. Right. But no. <laughs> yes, I think people like that, you know, um, it is a disability, and they don't sometimes know how to express love. Well. You know. She was affectionate, I have to admit. Well, they produced you. I mean, maybe yes, that's the right. irony. I think they produced you, who are yes. nice well, and successful. Exactly. And, and a wonderful human being. Well, maybe. I think so. <laughs> thousands of prints will attest to that, and hundreds of, or thousands of paintings, and tens of thousands of prints will attest to that. I have liked a lot of prints. I really like printmaking. It's, uh, well, I'm still doing it. That's pretty great. At 91, that's pretty great. Yeah, 91. That's what you said, right? <laughs> I, yeah. I also, Prince has, has been my life. I've been working with Prince for 30 years. And for me, it's the most democratic of art forms. And that's why I like Prince. Because really? a middle class person can afford a print. And, you know, why do you say they're democratic? Because um, they're within reach from all classes of life. Yeah. Yes, I think they're the most democratic. A lot of them are. A yes. Lot of them are. Yes. Of course, if you yes, some of them are very expensive now. Did you know I was a print collector at one time? I did not know that. I sold my print. I, I had a nice collection of prints, and um, I had a lot of. My printer printed for. Who did he print for? A who's who of prints, of printmakers between the wars. Okay. Oh, and I he had drawers full of proofs. Right. And I bought them from him for 10 or $15 a piece. Oh my God. They weren't worth wow. much more. They right. were worth more, but not that much more. Right. But then there was a, an explosion. And I remember going to Sotheby's once, and you know, I was just astounded at the prices. Right. And so uh, I remember I had 46 frame prints on the wall of my living room. And I called Sotheby's and said, I have a collection I'd like to sell. Well, bring them in. I said, I can't. They're all framed. Well, what do you got? I, I recited a few and I said, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they and the vice person. president got on the phone. Of course. And uh, she said, I'll be there tomorrow morning. It's amazing. 15 minutes later, the phone rang. The vice president was someone you may have heard of, Susan Pinsky. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And she said, uh, uh, my husband wants to come with me. <laughs> he was the president or vice president of Sotheby's, right. Mark Rosen. Right. So. They came, and Susan Bartow, who was the head of the department. Anyway, the three of them came, and it was wonderful. I mean, it was just, I made lunch. Right. And I would were, have loved to have seen that collection. Oh, boy, it was a great collection. I have a catalog somewhere of it, but I couldn't put my, I think, I don't think, I think it's in my studio in Arsenal. It was, a, it was the 46 print bought, bought a million two. So when was that, what, how long ago? 90s? Mm. Maybe 92. Okay. And were you, this might sound silly, but were you, did you have friends that were artists? Were you part of, did you feel like you were part of the artistic community in New York or were you no, an outlier? No, no. Okay. No, I had a couple of classmates who were artists and came to New York and went, no, I mean, one of them, I doubt if you heard of him, Robert Brodison. Uh, he had a marvelously successful show at uh, Catherine Viviano. Okay. It was a very important deal at the time. Total sellout. Every important museum bought a painting. All the important collections bought a painting. But they quickly found out what a really, what a real bastard he was. And he never got another show anywhere again, ever. I mean, he was just a rat. Right. He was just a rat. And he, his career died like a rat then. And, and drowned like a rat in the sewer. <laughs> I remember he came to a show at Far Gallery, a very successful show of mine. And he wouldn't come into the gallery. He stood at the door. And I walked over to the door. I said, come in, have a drink. 
He said, no. And he looked around. Crowded, nice. He said, do you think you really deserve this? Such bitterness. That's awful. An artist telling that to yeah. another artist? I don't know. <gasps> Ever. Right. Oh. Unheard of. It was... How oh, ungracious. I never saw him again. Right. Needless to say. Right. I wouldn't want to deal with him either. No, I would never want to see him again. No. He was much older than me. He had been in the war, of course, and uh, I hadn't. There's room for everyone, you know? There's no need to be like that. Well, it was his own doubts about himself, I guess. Yes. I hate to use a word like insecurity because it's too small a word, too trite, but he was really just I can't say that I've ever really made friends with another artist. My wife has a dear friend whose husband is an artist that you probably have heard of, Murray Zimmerlees. Yeah. He's uh, a known artist. He's yeah. had something of a career, mostly as an academic teaching. Right. And um, he hasn't had a, a, a large career of any kind. And, uh, you know, he's an okay artist. But we can't be friends for some reason. Right. It just doesn't work. He'll make comments like, gee, I wish I had a career like yours. Well, what am I supposed to say to that? Yeah, there's nothing well, you can say. Introduce him to Robert. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Robert, Robert Newman is, a, is my dealer in New York at okay. the old print shop. He's been very loyal and very good. And I've been with him at least 30 years more, 40 right. years, and uh, very nice. I understand uh, there's a new building going up where his building had been. On Lexington, right? Yeah. In the 20s? Yeah, in okay. the 20s, yeah. 31st Street, somewhere right, around, right. around there. And that he's leased space in the new building, and it will reopen soon. Nice. In the meantime, he's subletting somewhere else. He's very nice. Have you met him? I don't think I have. It's a wonderful gallery. And they carry a who's who of American art. Right. And do you send regular work down? Like, how do you, how do you yeah, show I know these it things? Is. Right. I know. Things are much easier now. Pardon? Things are much easier than the old days, right? You could uh, send oh, them yeah, well, through the post. <laughs> Will, would you like to look at some painting? Exactly. No. <laughs> and I put them against the wall. Yes. And what do they do? They right. look at them. Right. They can't help it. Right. When I started in the art world, people physically would carry their prints or their paintings to the gallery. Absolutely. Yes. I never sent slides. No. Because the secretary opens them up, puts them in another envelope, and sends them back. That's the end of that. Right. You, know, you want a react. You want a proper reaction. Yeah, I saw them going with my work, and if they would look at it, I would. Also, the human relationship is vital, I believe, between the artist and the dealer. Sometimes, sometimes. Yeah. I met some very interesting people. How has the art world changed in in the years that? Since you started, do you see it as a positive or? I can't tell you that because I really don't go in. I mean, the art world's in New York City. Yes. And I'm here. Yes. And I can't remember the last time I was in New York City. I mean, I just don't go in. Lori will go in. She'll take the train in. She has business there. Right. I used to belong to something called the Century. Right. And that was very nice. I used to go in there. She still belongs and she goes in. But I haven't been in for oh, I don't even know how many years. It's a journey from here. Absolutely. Pardon? It is a journey from here. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. It doesn't help. It doesn't help. No. I mean, it's not easy for me just to walk from Grand Central of course. to the Century, which is just a block and a half. Yes. It's only a block and a half away. They don't make it accessible. When I visit my son uh, and, and I, I don't walk with a cane, I feel exhausted by the end of the trip. 
Mm-hmm. Well, just sitting on a train is exhausting. Exactly. I don't know if you're going by train. I do. I go on yeah. by train. Yes. From Mosaic. Uh, from uh, Philadelphia. So it takes. Oh, from Philadelphia. Yes, that's, right. Right. That's, right. Yeah. that's right. That's right. We're yes. south there now. Yes. Georgia, yeah. Georgia, it's about two hours. Really? Yes. Yeah, it's a long trip. It's a long trip. You miss the city. This city. <laughs> I, it's funny, I miss them both. When we moved, um, we moved from Manhattan when our son was born because we thought we wanted to have our child at that time. It was just the one grow up in this sort of surrounding, although we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. So we were very happy in the city, lived on the Upper East Side. But when we got here, the community was so nice at just welcoming us. There was never that awkwardness of, taking 10 years to feel like you belong, mm. our neighbors, the, everyone, the people at the gas station and the bank and the market. And um, it just very quickly became home. And we were here for 16 years. That's um, a long time. It's a long yeah, time. it's like the, at the, I'm 53 now. So it's sort of the middle third of my life was here. And it's also the part that stays with me. And when Lucinda and I talk about what we miss, so we don't really have any friends down there. We just, we have our children and our dog and we've rented a, <clears throat> a lovely home. Um, but we miss just the familiarity. And like, if we, we still bank at the Salisbury Bank. No. Yeah, um, because when I need something done, I can text the bank manager and she sends me a smiley face and says it's done. I don't have to go through some big, scary corporate thing. So that's- Really, you still bank here? Yeah, that's funny. just because of that, because we know her. In fact, she's, she plays pool. She plays, um, she plays on a team. Um, it's funny that you should mention playing. She's a serious pool player. I think she lives in, in Dutchess County. And I just want, she loves the Yankees, yeah. Where do you play pool around here? I don't know, but I mean, you could ask Tara at the bank. I love playing pool. Do you still, do you have a table? No. No, because what I liked about pool was playing for money. Right. Gambling, I mean, that impetus that you had to win because if you lost, you lost something. Right. That you didn't want to lose. Right. That's a big impetus, particularly when you're young. Especially when you're young and relatively poor. Right. And I used to play for 50, 100, 200 a game. Really? Oh, yeah. I was a big time player. And so, what years was this? When were you, how, how, how old were you when this was? It was when I had the studio on 29th and 6th, and I moved my studio to Tarrytown in 89. So I guess it was in the 80s. Okay. In the late 70s and 80s. I was very thrilled to win, to come in fifth in the professional tournament at McGurr's. Have you heard of McGurr's? Mm-hmm. It's a big time pool. Yeah. It's amazing. So did people, was your life as an artist and life as a pool player completely different? Did either know that the other existed? No. Well, the people in the pool room knew I was an artist. Right. And my name was Bob the Artist. Right. They have silver gates. Right, right. For everybody, you know. Right. And uh, there were some strange people. But I never met anyone in the pool room that I'd want to see anywhere else. <laughs> I mean that. Yeah, I'm not surprised. I, one of the best players was a guy named Larry Johnson, okay. whose sobriquet was Boston Shorty because he was relatively short. Right. And uh, I remember with my first wife on a visit to Boston, where he was from, walking down the street in the evening and seeing him in a doorway sleeping with newspapers stuffed inside his jacket. Yeah. As a, which most bums use as a- To keep warm. As a, a insulation. Right. Yeah. And I, I was shocked, this was Boston Shorty. Right. One of the great players. One of the, one of the great, <laughs> really great players. Right. And that was, was that, had he fallen on hard times or was that just his in-between winning? Probably. Right. Probably. Um, sometimes it could be addictive. 
I knew that world pretty well, unfortunately. I'm, I'm not proud of it, but right. I enjoyed it. I made a living at it when I was much younger. Right. And uh, traveled around the country playing uh, different pool rooms. <coughs> and um, it was interesting. It was hard. Right. Not for me, but I could see that for most people there, it was a hard life. Right. It's not like the sort of English gentleman's billiards game at the club. Oh, no, no, no. In fact, I remember seeing a... Uh, Snooker? A, uh, a, an article in Life magazine of gangsters in Ohio. Wow. And it was someone that I knew very well. <coughs> so different strata of society there. Everything you've heard about it is true. Yes. It is true. And uh, it didn't rub off. <laughs> uh, what an interesting life. But it was interesting. I was, I, I uh, grabbed, uh, circulated in many circles. Right. <clears throat> I knew the pool ropes. I knew society, some, some levels of society. I knew some collectors. I knew a lot of dealers. I never got really uh, involved in cur the curatorial world. That was mostly handled by someone else. Uh, dealers would deal with that. Right. Uh, curators really don't want to deal with artists. Or uh, let, let me say traditionally, they didn't. Right. Maybe today it's different. Maybe if you're Jasper Johns, it's different. I've had a very good career. Nothing like that. Right. He lives up the road. I mean, right, right. That's the reason I'm pointing. Right. Uh, I mean, that, he's had a stellar uh, international career. Right. Uh, I don't present to that anything like that. But you, you came up at almost exactly the same time. Is that right? We're about a year apart. Yes. Right. And his deal was just down the block from mine. Castelli and uh, right and the contemporaries on the same street right but um, he was part of a movement uh, that was identifiable the pop art and there were many pop artists five major pop artists and uh, they were very dominant their reputations were huge their prices grew enormously I can't say that I have any regrets or any envy. I mean, I've done a lot better than I ever expected to. I put four kids through college. Sorry. I'm about to start, so that's impressive. Very Just that, impressive. if you did nothing else but that, that's impressive. It was, yeah. Especially with these days, the with college. And one girl, my girl, I have three boys and a girl. My girl went to a uh, an expensive school. Ithaca. Right. That was, that was, that was an expensive school. Do they live close by? Do they live in, I didn't hear you. Do they live close by? Their no. Uh, yeah. I have two boys in Albany who come to visit every five or six weeks. Okay. I have a girl in New York City okay. whom I see maybe once every two months. Okay. And I have a boy in Piscataway. Oh, Piscataway. Whom I see once every two months, maybe. Not too far. They're all very affectionate, very, you know, and we email, of course. Oh, that's lovely. Email is great. Email is great. Email is wonderful. And they're all very nice to me. Well, you were a good father. Maybe. <laughs> Their mother was hard. <laughs> first wives. I don't know if you have had one. I, fun enough, I do have a first wife. So uh, I've been married to my second wife for 25 years. The first one was five. It was well, I had the first one was 27, and this one 27. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> well, I've only known you with Lori, and seem very happy all the while. So. Oh, she seems lovely. I'm delighted. Uh, really nice house. She came with the house. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Do we? I, I feel like guilty taking up yes, so much time. Do we? Are you? I have all the pleasure. time that you want. It's a, such a pleasure. Let me see if there's anything that I can add. It's so kind of you. My work on the secondary market. I don't know who buys my work. I don't know if there's been a change in clientele or not. I don't. I don't meet the people who buy my work. I have no idea who or what they're like or who they are. Right. I just don't know. Um, I get letters, I get emails from people. So nice. Yeah, of course, when someone's going to write to you, they're going to write nice. Absolutely. You know? That your work has made such a difference in their life. Well, that's what I hear. It's wonderful. Yeah. Okay. I don't know, let's see. I think we covered everything, but I mean, we're happy I'm trying to for, see. for you to offer um, anything that you might want to, to say. I give a lot of thought to the titles and the punctuation and the lettering. Um, is that your poetic or literary side coming out or? Sometimes. I want to be concise, expressive. I use certain abbreviations, like W slash for with. Right. You know. But it is it is important. Uh, well, I thought so. I, I began as an abstract painter. But, uh, I guess that's it. I have an unrelated question. Yankees, Dodgers, yeah. Giants. Yeah. Which? I grew up a Giants fan. Right. They were at the Polo Grounds. Mm -hmm. And I went there frequently. Right. It was 50 cents. Hard to imagine. Of course, you sat in the nosebleeds. Right. But uh, it was only 50 cents. And I went there a lot. And I, it was wonderful. I just... And uh, so the, I saw a lot of Giants Dodgers games. Right. When they had Robinson and Campanella and Snyder. Yep, yep. Perillo. And uh, so I saw a lot of that. And it was very nice. It was exciting. Good. Uh, New York was a real baseball town. Yeah. And I don't think they ever came out for the Yankees the way they did for the Dodgers and the Giants. Right. They didn't. No. They just didn't. First of all, the Yankees, most of the season, most of the tickets are season holders, corporations. Right. Or corporations. Right. Uh, my father got free tickets to all the Yankee games. Because of whenever, the serious connection. Whenever I wanted to go, he would have free tickets. You know, we'd probably go twice a season. Right. And, uh, and they were good seats, you know, box seats. Right. In the first, on the second level. Okay. So you're... You're almost over second base. Right. It, it's, it's amazing. Right. It's amazing what you can see. And I enjoyed baseball a lot. Football, I think I went to one game. Right. Or two. I mean, Didn't the Giants used to play at the Polo Grounds? They did. Right. And then they played at Yankee Stadium as well, I seem to remember. I, I don't remember. Right. And uh, I remember going to Army-Navy games. Right. Which were a big spectacle. Right. All the marching and the right. troops. Right. And, you know. I, I enjoyed that until I was in the army. I got drafted. Right. <laughs> Developed a real distaste for the military. Right. I had a choice. I could be a lieutenant and serve for three years or a private and serve for two years. And I chose being a private. Good choice. Hmm? Good choice. Well, yeah, I didn't want to give up three years. No. Right. And I got three months off of good behavior. <laughs> did you ever get shipped overseas or did you stay overseas? I was scheduled to go to Korea. Right. And I got orders to go to Korea. Right. And I knew if I went to the captain to complain, he'd throw me out. Right. So I went to the PFC who typed the order. Smart. Very smart. And he said, uh, I said, I don't want to go to Korea. He says, uh, where do you want to go? I said, I'd like to stay in the United States. He said, uh, 
what do you give me? <laughs> what do you want? He said, a six pack. So I said, okay. So for a six pack, which at the time, as I recall, was a dollar twenty. Right. I didn't go to Korea. That's a good deal. That's a very good deal. It was a very good deal. Where were you stationed at that time? Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. My dad was in Shelby, Ohio at the same time and also didn't, um, he didn't go overseas. And I don't know why, but he... he Fort Worth was called the asshole of creation. <laughs> it was a desert. Right. It was 112 degrees every day. We had olive draft fatigues. Every night they were white from our salt, from our sweat. Right. White. Not, I mean, white. Right. It was awful. Sounds good. It was awful. A blip in a long, successful life. Pardon me? A blip in a long, successful life. Oh, thank you. I have a question that's unrelated, but I always find that you could tell a lot about a person by the music they listen to. Do you like music? Oh, yeah. If listen, so, what kind of music I, do you listen to? Well, let me preface that. When I was in the Army, uh, I had a week of bazooka training. And bazooka is a two-man operation. And my partner was a moron. And so they started firing from that end of the line. He pulled the trigger and went off by my ear. It was severe. I don't have it anymore. The reason I don't have it anymore, there was severe ringing in my ear. But eventually the nerves die. They right. keep going like that, vibrating. That's right. the ringing. Right. But they get tired of vibrating and they die. Right. And I wear hearing aids now. But uh, he was a real moron. And uh, and I, tr I I thought it was a disability to get me out of the service, but they told me I couldn't prove I had ringing in my ears. That's awful. It was amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. It was amazing. It, was, it persisted for decades. Right. It was just awful. Just awful. It was loud at first. Right. You ever been on a firing range? I have. I remember the first time I heard a gun go off, I couldn't believe how loud it was. It's it was very just loud. a pistol. Mostly you have to wear yeah. You wear hearing right. guards. But it is it makes a lot of noise. Yeah. And it's a percussive sound. Right. You know. Right, it's exactly. It's not slow and steady, it's one big no, bang. It's boom. Right. And so uh it was pretty tough. It was pretty tough. I really hated being in the service. But what about so music wise? Did you, despite the hearing, we were still able so to enjoy? So I had to listen to music to block the ringing. I had to have some, and of course, my choice was having to be classical music. So I had to play it. I played it and I played it. You know, I didn't play it too loud, but if I was listening to music, I didn't hear the ringing. Right. And so I could listen to music in pain. I couldn't listen to the, to the ringing in pain. Right. It was really awful. It lasted for quite a while, though. several decades, I'm sure. Right. But um, I, I gained quite an informal education in classical music, listening to QXR. Right. Because they had some wonderful broadcasters who um, talked about the music. Yeah. And there were programs two hours a day, one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon. I mean, one was Carl Haas right. and the other was somebody else, or David Zubal. But they talked about the music. And right. Actually gave a musicology lesson. Right. It was fascinating. Wonderful. It was just fascinating. It's an education. It was. It was. So I, I have some knowledge of classical music and... Uh, I enjoy that. We go to concerts once in a while. Right. Up in Great Barrington, the Berkshire Bar. Right. And uh, we walk there. It was sad when QXR sort of closed down. Um, and one of the, the uh, broadcasters is on the air in Philadelphia. Because I was listening to, or a colleague was listening to the Philadelphia Classical Station. Who was he? Do you remember? I'm trying to remember because I knew who it was before he said his name. Um, because I was listening to a lot of classical music in the 80s and 90s, and I would pull over. Really? really? 
So I'd pull over and I'd write down quickly like a Deutsche Grammophone. Yeah, that's, um, right. that's what I would do. <laughs> you know, Ravel and yes. whoever the conductor was. And I would go to Tower Records. That's where I went. And I would have my list and it would be like, like had to be that conductor, that orchestra, that recording. Because that's right. always what it was. Like, I like that piece of music, but I really like so-and-so, whoever it was. Or I remember Ray Fawn Williams was one of the first things that I heard. Um, what's his most famous thing? Uh It'll come to me. I heard it and I just I had never heard classical music like that before. So I ran out and I got it and it was always that recording. But um, I'll think of who that DJ was and I'll send you an email or something because you'll you'll remember. And they all seem to, they were just on for 40 years at peace or something or 50 years. I right. remember having a correspondence with David Duval. Really? Yeah, it was very interesting. I remember he had a very particular voice on the radio. It was, yeah. I loved him. It was a very nice voice. Yeah. Very nice voice. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Comforting, soothing. Yes. Right. Now we should leave you yes. in peace. You've been so lovely, Robert. It's been such an honor and a joy for me. Well, I don't know why you. it's an honor, but I enjoyed it too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop my... Thank you so much.